welcome to the Potlets Podcast. Hi, everybody. This is the Potlets. We are back this week with a special guest, Ellen Corbis. Ellen will introduce herself in a little bit, but also on the show, it's myself, Carlisa Campos, Michael Gash, and Duffy Cooley. Hey, everybody. Today's topic is Kubernetes sucks for developers, right? No. And Ellen is going to introduce herself now and tell us all about what that even means. Hi, I'm Al. I do developer relations at Tilt. Tilt is a company whose main focus is development experience when it comes to Kubernetes and multi-service development. Before Tilt, I used to work at Garden. They basically do the same thing. It's just a different approach. So that is basically the topic that we're going to discuss, the fact that Kubernetes does not have to suck for developers. You just need to, you need some hacks and fixes and tools, and then things get better. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. I've actually seen Tilt being used uh, in in some pretty you know high-profile open source projects. Like I've seen it being used in Cluster API and some of the work I've seen there and and some of the other ones. What are some of the larger projects that you're aware of that are using it today? Oh boy, that's complicated because every company has a different policy as to whether I can name them publicly or not. So let's go around that question a little bit. You might notice that Lyft has a talk at KubeCon where they're going to talk about Tilt. So I can't tell you right now that they use Tilt, but there's that. So hopefully I found a legal loophole here. <laughs> so I, I think they're the, the biggest name you can find right now. Cluster API is, of course, huge. And, and Cluster API is fun because the way they're doing things is very different. We're used to seeing mostly companies that do apps in some way or another, like websites, phone apps, etc. And then Cluster API is completely insane. It's, it's something else totally. There's tons of other companies. I'm not sure which ones that are large I can name specifically. There are smaller companies. So Uno Motors, it, they do electric motorcycles. It's a company here in Berlin. They have like 25 developers. They're using Tilt. We have very tiny companies like Mindspace. Their studio in Tucson, Arizona. They also use Tilt and it's like a three-person team. So we have the whole spectrum from very, very tiny companies that are using Docker for Mac and pretty happy with it, all the way up to huge companies with their own fleet of development clusters and all of that, and they're using Tilt as well. Quick, that sounds awesome. Yeah, quick question, Alan. So, um, and the title says developers. What is the, like developers is a pretty broad name, and I hear people um, saying that, okay, too, Kubernetes is too raw, it's going to more like a Linux kernel. So we want this PaaS experience. So our business developers, our application developers are developing in there. So what is, how would you de describe a developer interfacing with Kubernetes using the tools that you just mentioned? Is it the traditional enterprise developer or more Kubernetes developers, like work, developing on Kubernetes? No, I specifically mean not Kubernetes developers. Mm -hmm. So you have people working in Kubernetes proper. For example, uh, the Cluster API folks, they're doing stuff that is Kubernetes specific. So that is not my focus. The focus is you're a back-end developer, you're a front-end developer, you're the person configuring, I don't know, the databases or whatever. So basically, you work at a company, you have your own business logic, you have your own product, your own app, your own internal stuff, all of that, but you are not a Kubernetes developer. It just so happens that if the stuff you are uh, working on is going to be pointing at Kubernetes, it's going to target Kubernetes, then one, you're the, the target developer for me, for my work. And two, usually you're going to have a hard time doing your job. So we can talk a bit about why. So one issue is development clusters. If you're using Kubernetes in prod, rule of thumb, you should be using Kubernetes in dev because you don't want completely separate environments where things work in your environment as a developer and then you push them and they break. So you don't want that. So you need some kind of development cluster. And the type of cluster that that's going to be uh, is going to vary 
according to the level of complexity that you want and that you can deal with. So like I said, some people are pretty happy with Docker for Mac. I hear all the time this complaint that, oh, you're running Kubernetes on your machine. It's going to catch fire. And okay, there's some truth to that. But also it depends on what you're doing. No one tries to run Netflix, let's say the whole Netflix on their laptop, because we all know that's not reasonable. But people try to do similar things on their Minikube or Docker for Mac, and then it doesn't work, and they say, oh, Kubernetes on the laptop doesn't work. No, yeah, it does, just not for you. So that that's a complaint I particularly dislike because it comes from a, it, it's kind of a blanket statement that has no, let's say, no facts behind it. So yeah, if you're a small company, Docker for Mac is going to work fine for you. Like, let's say you have a beefy laptop with 30 gigs of RAM. You can put a lot of software in 30 gigs. You can put a lot of microservices in 30 gigs. So that's going to work up to a point, and then it's going to break. And when it breaks, you're going to need to move to a cloud. You're going to need to do remote uh, development. And then you're going to go to GCP or Azure or Amazon. You're going to set up a cluster there. Some people use the managed Kubernetes options. Some people just spin up a bunch of machines and wire up Kubernetes by themselves. That's going to depend on basically how much you have in terms of resources and in terms of needs. Usually, keeping up a remote cluster that works is going to demand more infrastructure work. Like you're going to need people who know how to do that to keep in, keep an eye on that. There's all the billing aspect, which is you can run Docker for Mac all day and you're not going to pay extra. But if you leave a bunch of stuff running on Google, you're going to have a bill at the end of the month that you need to pay attention to. So that is one thing for people to think about. Another aspect that I see very often that people don't know what to do with is config files. So you scroll Twitter, you scroll Kubernetes Twitter for five minutes, and there's a joke about YAML. And we all hate editing YAML, but again, the same way people make jokes about using uh, about Kubernetes setting your laptop on fire, I would argue that you're not meant to edit Kubernetes YAML by hand. And the tooling for that is arguably not as mature as the tooling when it comes to Kubernetes clusters to run on your laptop. So you have stuff like Helm templates, you have KSonnet, I think there's one called Customize, but I haven't used it myself. So what I see in every company from the two-person team to the 600-person team is no one writes Kubernetes YAML by hand. So everyone uses a template solution, a templating solution of some sort. And that is the first thing that I always tell people when they start making jokes about YAML is if you're editing YAML by hand, you're doing it wrong. So you shouldn't do that in the first place. It's something that you set up once at some point and you look at it whenever you need to. But on your day-to-day, when you're writing your code, you should not touch those files, not by hand. We have five minutes, and you threw so much at us. We need to start breaking some of this stuff down. Okay. It's let, amazing. Let me, throw, let me throw you one last thing then, because that is yeah. what I do personally. So one more thing that we can discuss is the development feedback loop. So you're writing your code. You're working on your application. You make a change to your code. How much work is it for you to see that new line of code that you just wrote live and running? For most people, it's a very long journey. I asked that on Twitter. A lot of people said it was over half an hour. A very tiny amount of people said it was between five minutes and half an hour. And only a very tiny fraction of people said it was two seconds or less. And the goal of my job, of my work, uh, the goal of Tilt, the tool, which is made by the company I work for, also called Tilt, is to get everyone in that two seconds range. I've done that on stage and talks where we, we take an application and we go from, okay, every time you make a change, you need to build a new Docker image, uh, you need to push it to a registry, you need to update your cluster, blah, 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 and that's going to take minutes, whole minutes. And we take that from all that long and we dial it down to a couple seconds. So you make a change, you save your file, snap your fingers, and poof, it's up and running the new version of your app. So it's basically real time, perceptually real time, just like back in when everyone was doing Ruby on Rails and you would just save your file and see if it worked basically instantly. So that is the part of this discussion that personally I, I focus more on. I'm going to love to jump into the how 
in a little bit. I want to circle back to the beginning. I love the question that Michael asked at the beginning, what is considered developer? Because that really makes a difference. First, to understand who we are talking about. And I think this conversation can go in circles and not that I'm saying we are going in circles, but this conversation out in the wild can go in circles until we have an understanding of the difference between can you as a developer use Kubernetes in a somewhat not pain, pain, painful way, <laughs> but should you? And I'm very interested interested to take to get your take and Michael and Duffy's take as well, as far as should we be doing this and should all of developers be, be using Kubernetes throughout through the development process? And then we also have to consider people who are not using Kubernetes because a lot of people out there are not using Kubernetes. And for developers in special, they hear how oh, Kubernetes is painful and definitely not for developers. So obviously that is not going to qualify Kubernetes as a tool that they're going to look into. It's just not motivating. So if there is any anything that, that would make people motivated to look into Kubernetes to that would be beneficial for them, not just for, for you know using Kubernetes for Kubernetes sake, but would it be useful? Basically, why? Why would it be useful? I think from the point of view of a developer, you should try and stay away from Kubernetes for as long as you can. Kubernetes comes in when you start having issues of scale. So it's a production matter. It's not a development matter. So I don't know, like a DevOps issue, operations issue. Ideally, you you put off moving your application to Kubernetes as long as possible. And this is an opinion. We can argue about this forever. Just because it introduces a lot of complexity, and if you don't need that complexity, you should probably stay away from it. But to get to the other half of the question, which is, if you're using Kubernetes in production, should you use Kubernetes in development? Now here, I'm going to say yes, 100% of the time. Blanket statement, of course, we can argue about minutia, but I think so. Because if you don't, you end up having separate environments. So let's say you're using Docker Compose because you don't like Kubernetes. So you're using Kubernetes in production. So in development, you are going to need containers of some sort. So let's say you're using Docker Compose. Now you're maintaining two different environments. You update something here, you have to update it there. One day it's going to be Friday, you're going to be tired, you're going to update something here, you're going to forget to update something there, or you're going to update something there, and it's going to be slightly different. Or maybe you're doing something that has no equivalent between what you're using locally and what you're using in production. And then basically you're in trouble. So I've seen, I've heard from many companies that the main reason they decided to use Kubernetes in development is that they wanted to mimic production as closely as possible. One argument we can have here is that, oh, but if you're using Kubernetes in development, that's going to add a lot of overhead and you're not going to be able to do your job right. And I agree that that was true for a while, but right now we have enough tooling that you can basically make Kubernetes disappear and you just focus on being a developer, writing your code, uh, doing all of that stuff. And Kubernetes is sitting there in the background. You don't have to think about it and you can just go on about your business with the advantage that now your development environment and your production environment are going to very closely mimic each other. So you're not going to have issues with those uh, potential disparities. All right. So another thing too, is that I think we're making an assumption that the developers we are talking about are the kind of developers that are also responsible for deployment. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes that's not the case. And uh, I'm going to shut up now. But it would be interesting to talk about that too between all of us. Is that what we're seeing? Is, is there like the case that now developers are responsible? It's like developers, DevOps is I think, it's just so ubiquitous that we don't even consider differentiating between developers and, and ops people? All right. I think I'd put a different spin on it. I think that it's not necessarily that developers are the ones operating the infrastructure. The problem is that if your infrastructure is operated by a platform that that may require some integration at the application layer to really uh, hit its stride, then the question becomes, how do you as a developer become more familiar? What is the user experience as it, or what's, I should say, what's the developer experience around that integration? Like what can you do to improve that so that the uh, developer can understand better or play with 
how service discovery works or understand better or play with how the different services in their application will be able to interact without having to kind of redefine that in different environments, which is, I think, what Ellen's point was. Yeah, at the most basic level, you have issues as such as you made a change to a service here, let's say on your local Docker Compose, and now you need to update your Kubernetes manifest on your cluster for things to make sense. So let's say, I don't know, you change the name of a service, something as simple as that. Even those kinds of things that sound silly to even describe, when you're doing that every day, one day you're going to forget it, things are going to explode, you're not going to know why, you're going to lose hours uh, trying to figure out where things went wrong. Also, same with version drift, maybe. Even if you use Kubernetes locally, you might run a later version of Kubernetes, maybe use Kind for local development, but then your cluster or your remote cluster is on, on three or four versions behind. Shouldn't be because of the version support policy, but it might happen, right? And so then APIs might be deprecated or you're using different APIs. So I totally agree with you, Alan, that your um, development environment should reflect production as close as possible. But even there, you have to make sure that prod... Um, like your kind of APIs matches, API types matches, and all, all the stuff, right? Because they could also break. You are definitely right that bugs are not going away anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. And I think this discussion also remembers me of um, the discussion that um, the folks in, in the cloud world have with AWS Lambda, for example, because that's kind of similar. Even though there are tools to kind of simulate or mimic these um, platforms, um, uh, like serverless platforms, Locally, the um, the general recommendation there is to embrace the cloud and develop in the cloud, natively in the cloud, because that's that's something you cannot resemble. You cannot run DynamoDB locally. You could, you could mimic it. You could mimic Lambda runtimes locally, but essentially it's it's going to be drift. It's going to be different. And so, the, but that that's also a common a complaint in, in in the world of AWS and cloud development, which is it's really not that easy to develop locally where you're supposed to develop. On the platform that that the code is being shipped and run onto, because you cannot run the cloud locally. <laughs> sounds sounds crazy, but it is. And so um, even I, I think the same is with Kubernetes. Even though we have the tools, I don't think that every developer runs Kubernetes locally. Most of them maybe don't even have Docker locally. So they they use the Spring tools and then they have some pipeline and eventually it gets shipped as a container pod in in, in Kubernetes. And that's what I wanted to throw in here as a more like a question experience, especially for you. For you, Alan, with these customers that you work with, what are the different profiles that you see from a maturity perspective on these customers? Large enterprises might be different than the smaller ones that, that you mentioned. And how do you see them having different requirements? As also what Calicia said, like, do they do ops or DevOps? Or is it like strictly separated there, um, especially in large enterprises? What I see the most, let's get the last part first. Yeah, um, question, sorry for that. Yeah. So when it comes to who operates Kubernetes, who deploys to Kubernetes, definitely most developers push their code to Kubernetes uh, themselves. So of course, this involves CI and testing and PRs and all of that. So it's not like you can just go crazy and break everything. When it comes to operating the production cluster, then that's separate. So usually you have someone writing code and someone else operating clusters uh, and infrastructure. Uh, sometimes it's the same person, but they're kind of clearly uh, separate roles, even even if it's the same person doing it. Uh, but usually you go from your IDE to PR, and that goes straight into production once the whole process is done. Now, we were talking about workflows and Lambda and all of that. So... I don't see a good solution for Lambda, like a good uh, development experience for Lambda just yet. So it feels a bit like it needs some refinement still. When it comes to Kubernetes, you asked, do most developers run Kubernetes locally? Do they not? And I don't I don't know about the numbers, the absolute numbers. Like, is it most doing this or most doing that? I'm not sure. I only know the companies I'm in touch with. Definitely not all developers run Kubernetes on their laptops because it's a problem of scale. Right now, we are basically stuck with 30 gigs of RAM on our laptops. If your app is bigger than that, tough luck, you're not going to run it on the laptop. But what most developers do is they still maintain a local development environment where they can do development without going through CI. I think that is the main 
the main question. So they, they maintain agility in their development process. So what we usually see when you don't have the uh, Kubernetes on your laptop and you're using remote Kubernetes, so a remote development cluster in some cloud provider, what most people do, and this is not the companies I talk to, this is basically everyone else. What most people do is they they make their development environment be the same or work the same way as their production environment. So you make a change to your code, you have to push a PR that has to get tested uh, by CI, it has to get approved, and then it ends up in the Kubernetes cluster. So your feedback loop as a developer is insanely slow because there's so much red tape between you changing a line of code and you getting a new process running in your cluster. Now, when you use tools, I call the category MDX, and I basically coined that category name myself. So MDX is a multi-service development experience tooling. When you use uh, MDX tools, and that's not just Tilt, it's Tilt, it's Garden, where I used to work. People use Telepresence like that. There is Scaffold from Google and so on. There's a bunch of tools. When you use a tool like that, you can have your, uh, your feedback loop down to a second, like I said before. So I think that is the major improvement developers can do if they're using Kubernetes remotely and even if they're using Kubernetes locally. I would guess most people do not run Kubernetes uh, locally. They use uh, remotely. Like we have clients, well, clients, we have users uh, who don't even have Docker on their local machines because if you have the right tooling, you can change the files on your machine you have stuff, you have tooling running that detects those file changes. Uh, it syncs those file changes to your cluster. The cluster then uh, rebuilds images or restarts containers or syncs live code that's already running. And then you, you, you can see those changes reflected uh, in your development cluster right away, even though you don't even have Docker in your machine. So there's all of those possibilities. Do you see security issues with that approach with like not knowing the, the architecture of Tilt, but even though it's just a development clusters, there might be stuff that could break or you could break by kind of bypassing the, the red tape, as you said? Usually we assign one user per namespace. So usually every developer has a namespace and Kubernetes itself has enough options that if that's a concern to you, you can make it secure. Most people don't worry about it that much because it's development clusters. They're not accessible to the public. Usually there's like, you know, you can only access it through a VPN or something of that sort. So we haven't heard about security issues so far. I'm sure they're going to pop up at some point. I'm not sure how severe it's going to be or how hard it's going to be to fix. I am assuming, because none of this stuff is meant to be accessible to the wider internet, that it's not going to be a hard problem to tackle. I would like to back up for a second, because I feel like we're kind of pretty far down the road on on like what the value of this particular pattern is without really explaining like what it is. And so I want to back this up for just a minute and talk about like, you know, some of the things that the tooling like this are, is trying to solve in kind of a use case sort of model, right? So like... Back in the day when I was learning Python, I remember like really struggling with the idea of being able to debug Python kind of live. And I came across IPython, which is a REPL. And that was like, which was like hugely eye-opening because it gave me the ability to like interact with my code live. It also opened me up to the idea that like, you know, like it was an improvement over things like um, having to commit a new log line against a particular function and then push that new function up to the place where it would actually get, you know, some use and then be able to go look at that log line and see what's coming out of it. Or like, do I actually have enough logs to even put together what went wrong? You know, and that whole, you know, set of use cases, I think is somewhat addressed by tooling like this. But I do, I do think we should talk about like, how do we get here? And like, how does that actually, and how does, how does tooling like this address some of those things? And like, which, use cases specifically, is it looking to uh, address? I guess where I'm going with this is like, to your point, so tooling like Tilt, for example, right, is the idea that you can, as far as I understand it, inject into a running application, a new instance that would be able to, uh, that you would have like local development control over. Like if you make a change to that code, then the instance running inside of your target environment would rep would be represented by that new code change very quickly, 
right? Basically solving the problem of making sure that making sure that you know you have some very quick feedback loop. Like, I mean, like functionally, that's that's the killer feature here, and I think it's really interesting to see tooling like that start to develop, right? Another example of tooling would be like the REPL thing, where wherein instead of like writing your code and compiling your code and seeing the output, you could do a thing where you're actually like inside the, you know, running as a thread inside of the code and you can like dump a data structure and you can modify that data structure and you can see if your function actually does the right thing without having to like go back and write that code kind of like while imagining all of those data data structures in your head. You know, it's like different tooling like this, I think is pretty killer. Yeah, I think one area where that is still partially untapped right now where this tooling could go and i'm kind of pushing it but it you know it's a process it's not something we can do overnight is to have very high level patterns be let's say codified so for example everyone's copying docker files and kubernetes manifests and terraform config files which i forgot what they're called Everyone's copying that stuff from the internet, from other websites, and, and that's cool. Like, oh, you need a container that does such and such and sets up this environment and provides these tools. Just download this image and everything is all set up for you. So one area where I see things going is for us to have that same kind of portability, but for development environments. So for example, I did this whole talk about, you know, how to take your, your Go code, your Go application from, uh, I don't know, a 30 seconds feedback loop uh, where you're rebuilding an image every time you make a code change and all of that down to one second. And there's a lot of hacks in there that span all kinds of stuff. Like, should you use Go Vendor or should you keep your, your dependencies cached inside a Docker layer? Those kinds of things. And then I went down a bunch of, uh, a bunch of those things and eventually came up with a workflow that was basically the best I could find in terms of development experience. Like, what is the snappiest workflow? Or, for example, you could have what is uh, a workflow that makes it really easy to debug my Go app? So you would use applications like Squash, and that's a debugger that you can connect to a process running in a live container. So those kinds of things. If we can prepackage those and offer those to users, and not just for Go and not just for, de- for debugging, but for all kinds of development workflows, I think that would be really great. So we can offer those types of experiences to people who don't necessarily have uh, the inclination to develop those workflows themselves. Yeah, I agree. And I, I mean, it is interesting. I've had a few conversations lately about the fact that, like, you know, kind of the the abstraction layer of coding in the way that we think about it really hasn't changed over time, right? Like it's the same sort of thing. So that's actually a really relevant point. Like it's also interesting to think about like, you know, with these sorts of frameworks and this sort of tooling, it might be kind of interesting to think of like what else we can, what else we can enable the developer to have a feedback loop on more quickly, right? Like if, you know, as to your point, right? Like we talked about how, these different environments, your development environment and your production environment, like the the general consensus is that they should be as close as you can get them reasonably, right? So that the behavior in one should somewhat mimic the behavior in the other. At least that's that's the story we tell ourselves, right? So given that, like would it also it would also be kind of interesting if the developer was getting feedback from like effectively how the security posture of that particular cluster might affect the work that they're doing. Right, like you do actually have to define network policy, and you, maybe you don't necessarily have to think about it. If we can provide tooling that can abstract that away, but at least you should be aware that it's happening, so that you understand, you know, if it's not working correctly, this is where you might be able to see the sharp edges pop up. You know what I mean? Like that sort of thing. Yeah, at the last KubeCon, where was it in San Diego? There was this this running joke. I, I was running around with the security crowd, and there was this joke about kubectl apply security.yaml, and it was kind of in a mocking tone. And I mean, it was, it, I'm, I'm not disparaging their joke. It was a good joke. But then I was thinking, what if we can make this real? Like, I, I mean, maybe it is real. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't do security myself. But what if we can apply a comprehensive enough set? of um, security measures, security monitoring, security scanning, all of that stuff, we prepackage it. We allow users to access all of that with 
one command or even less than that. Maybe you pre-configure it as a team lead and then everyone else in your team can just use it without even knowing that it's there. Uh, and then it just lets you know, like, oh, hey, this thing you just did, uh, this is a potential security issue that you should know about. So, yeah, I think coming up with these developer shortcuts, it's kind of my my hobby. <laughs> That's cool. And the what you just mentioned, uh, Alan and Duffy, uh, remembers me on, uh, uh, reminds me on uh, the Spring community, the Spring framework where a lot of the the boilerplate or like be it security stuff or connections, integrations, etc., is being abstracted away and you just annotate your code a bit and then some framework uh, in, in Spring, obviously it's a Spring framework, but in your case, Alan, what you were hinting to is maybe this, this kind of build environment that gives me these um, integration hooks where I just annotate or even those annotations could be enforced, like standards could be enforced if I don't annotate at all, right? I could maybe overwrite them. And then this and build environment would just pick it up because it sees my it, it scans the code right it has a source code access so it just could just scan it and then hook into it and then apply security policies lock it down see ports being used maybe just open them up to the application the other ones will automatically be blocked etc cetera, etc cetera. that just came to my mind I have not done any research there whether there's already some some place or activity. Yeah, so because I won't shut up about this stuff because I just. Love it. We are doing a, it's in a very early stage right now. We are doing a thing at Tilt where we're calling extensions. So very creative name, I suppose, but it's basically like Go imports, but for those workflows. And it's still at a very early stage. So we still have some road ahead of us. But for example, we have, uh, let's say this one user uh, and they did some uh, very special integration of Helm and Tilt. So you don't have to use Helm by hand anymore. You can just make all of your Helm stuff happen automatically when you're using Tilt. And usually you would have to copy like, I don't know, 100 lines of code from your Tilt uh, config file and copy that around for other developers to be able to use it. So now we're, we have this thing that it's basically like Go imports, where you can just say load extension and give it a name. It uh, fetches it from a repository and it's running. So I think that is basically an early stage of what you just described with Spring, but more for more geared towards let's say an infra Kubernetes, like how do you tie infra Kubernetes, that kind of stuff with a uh, higher level functionality that you might want to mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. Cool. I have another one. So, so speaking of which, is there any or are there any integrations for IDEs with Tilt? Because I know that VS Code, for example, has Kubernetes integrations. There's the Fabricate Maven plugin, which kind of handles some stuff under the covers. So usually Tilt watches your code files and it doesn't care which IDEs you use. Uh, it has its own dashboard, which is just a page that you open on your browser. I have just heard this week, someone mentioned on Slack that they wrote an extension for Tilt. I'm not sure if it was for VS Code or the other VS Code like .NET editors. Um, you know, I, I don't remember what it's called but they, they have like a, a family of those. So I just heard that someone wrote one of those uh, and they shared the repo. So we have someone looking into that. I haven't seen it myself. Uh, the idea has come up when I was working at Garden, which is, you know, in the same area as Tilt. So I, th I think it's it's pertinent. Uh, we also had the, the idea of a, of a VS Code extension. But the, I think the question is, what do you put in the extension? What do you make the, the VS Code extension do? Because both Tilt and Garden, they have their own web dashboards that show users what should be shown and in the manner that we think should be shown. So if you're going to create a VS Code extension, you, you either replicate that completely and you basically take the stuff that was in the browser and put it in the IDE. I don't particularly see much benefit in, in that. If enough people ask, maybe we'll do it, but... It's not something that I find particularly useful. So either you do that and you replicate the functionality or you come up with new functionality. And in both cases, I just don't see a very strong point as to what different and IDE-specific functionality should you want. 
Yes. So, and the reason why I was, why I was asking is that we see all these Pulumi's uh, CDKs, AWS CDKs coming up where you basically use a programming language to write your application slash application infrastructure code in, in, in your IDE. And then all the, the templating, the, the YAML stuff, et cetera, gets generated under covers. And uh, just this week, AWS announced the uh, CDKs, uh, like the CDK basically for, for Kubernetes. And I was thinking, was this, with this happening, uh, where some of these providers abstract the, the scaffolding as well, including the build, right? You, you don't even have to build because it's kind of abstracted away under the covers. I, I was seeing this trend. And then obviously we still have Helm and the templating and the customize. And then we still have the manual, as you, as you mentioned in the beginning. And so I do like the IDE integration because that's where I spend most of my time. And whenever I have to leave the IDE, it's kind of a context switch that I have to go through. And uh, even if it's just for, for opening another file or so that I need to add it somewhere. And that's why I think having IDE integration is, is useful for developers because that's where they most spend up their time. But as you said, there might be reasons to not do it in an IDE because you're just replicating functionality that might not be useful there. Yeah, so in the case of Tilt, all the config is is written in uh, Starlark, which is a, a language, and it's basically Python. So if your IDE can syntax highlight Python, it can syntax highlight the Tilt config files. About Pulumi and that kind of stuff, I'm not that familiar. It's stuff that I kind of know how it works, but I haven't used it myself, so I'm I'm not familiar with the browsing the the IDE integration side of it. The thing about tools like Tilt is that usually if you set set it up right, you can just write your code all day and you don't have to look at the tool. You you just switch from your IDE to, let's say, your browser where your app is running, so you get feedback and that kind of thing. But once you configure it, you don't really spend much time looking at it. You're going to look at it when there are errors. Uh, so, you know, you, you try to refresh your application and it fails. So you need to find that error. By the time that happened, you already lost focus from your code anyway. So whether you're going to look for your error on a terminal or on the tilt uh, dashboard, that's really, that's not that's right. much that's of an right. issue. That's right. I agree. So all this talk about tooling and IDEs uh, is making me think to ask you, Ellen, if I'm a developer and let's say my company decides, oh, we're going to use Kubernetes. And so we what we are advocating here with this episode is to think about, well, if you're going to be deployed to uh, Kubernetes in production, you should consider running Kubernetes as a local development environment. Now, for those developers who don't even haven't even worked with Kubernetes, where do you suggest they jump in? Do, should they sort of get a handle on work? Because it's too many things. I mean, Kubernetes already is so big and there are so many toolings around to how to operate Kubernetes itself. So for a developer who is, okay, I, I like this idea of having my own local Kubernetes environment or, or a development environment somehow may, could also be in the cloud. Should they start with a tooling like Tilt or something similar? Would that make it easier for them to wrap their head around Kubernetes and what Kubernetes does? Or should they first get a handle on Kubernetes and then look at a tool like this? Okay, so there are a few sides to this question. If you have a very large team, ideally you should get one or a few people to actually really learn Kubernetes and then make it so that everyone else doesn't have to. So something we have seen is like very large company, they are gonna do Kubernetes in development they set up a developer experience team. And then, for example, they have their own wrapper around kubectl. And then basically they automate a bunch of stuff so that everyone in the team doesn't have to take, you know, a certified Kubernetes application development uh, certificate. Because like for people who don't know that certificate, it's basically how much uh, kubectl can you do off the top of your head? That is basically what that certificate is about because kubectl is it's an insanely huge and powerful tool. So on, on the one hand, you should do that. If you have a big team, take a few people, learn all that you can about Kubernetes, 
write some wrappers so that people don't have to do kubectl something something by hand. Just make very easy functions like, you know, kubectl, let's say, you know, uh, name of your wrapper, context and a name, and then that's going to switch you to a namespace, let's say, where some version of your app is running. So that kind of thing. Now about the tooling. Once you have your development environment set up, and you're going to need someone who has some experience with Kubernetes to set that up in the first place. But once that is set up, if you have the right tooling, you don't really have to know everything that Kubernetes uh, does. You should have at least a conceptual overview. But I can tell you for sure that there's hundreds of developers out there writing code that is going to be deployed to Kubernetes writing code that whenever they make a change to their code, it goes to a Kubernetes development cluster and they don't have the first, well, I'm not going to say the first clue, but they are not experienced Kubernetes users. And that's because of all the tooling that you can put around it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so you can abstract a bunch of stuff with basically good sense so that you know the common operations that need to be done for your team and then you just abstract them away. Uh, so that people don't have to become kubectl experts. And uh, on the other side, you can also abstract a bunch of stuff away with tooling. And basically, as long as your developer has, you know, the basic grasp of containers and, you know, basics of Kubernetes, that kind of stuff, they don't need to know how to operate it with any kind of depth. Hey, Alan, in the beginning, you said that, like, it's all about this feedback loop and iterating fast. And part of the feedback loop for a developer is unit testing, integration testing, or all sorts of testing. How do you see that changing or being like benefiting from tools like Tilt, especially when it comes to integration testing? Unit tests usually locally, but integration testing. So one thing that people can do when they're using Tilt is once you have Tilt running, you basically have all of your application running. And you can just set up one-off tasks with Tilt. So you could basically set up a script that does a bunch of stuff, which would basically be what your test does. And if it returns uh, zero, it succeeded. If it doesn't, it failed. So you can set something up uh, like that. It's not something that we have right now in a prepackaged form that you can use right away. So you would basically just say, hey, Tilt, run this thing for me. And then you would uh, see if it worked or not. I have to make a plug to the competition right now. Uh, Garden has more of that part of it, that part of things set up. They have tests as a separate primitive right next to, you know, building and deploying, which is what you usually see. So they also have testing. And it does basically what I just said about Tilt, but they have kind of a special little framework around it. So with Garden, you would say, oh, here's a test. Uh, Here's how you run the test. Here's what the test depends on, et cetera. And then it runs it and it tells you if it failed or not. With Tilt, it would be a more generic approach where you would just say, hey, Tilt, run this and tell me if it fails or not. But without the like the little wrapping around it that specific that's specific for testing. When it comes to how things work, like when you're trying to push to production, let's say you you you've done a bunch of stuff locally, you're happy with it, now it's time to push to production. And then there's all that headache with CI and waiting for tests to run and flaky tests and all of that. That, I don't know. That is a big open question that everyone's unhappy about and no one really knows which way to run to. That's awesome. Where do you see this space going in the future? I mean, like like as you look at the tooling that's out there, uh, maybe not specifically to the Tilt particular service or, or capability, but like where do you see some other people kind of exploring that space. Like we were talking about like AWS dropping a CDK and they're like definitely different people trying to solve the YAML problem, but like more from the developer user experience tooling kind of way, like where do you see that kind of space going? For me, it's all about higher level abstractions and well-defined best practices. So right now everyone is fumbling around in the dark, not knowing what to do, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. The main thing that I see changing is that given enough time, best practices are going to emerge and it's going to be clear for everyone. If you're doing this kind of thing, you should use this kind of workflow. If you're doing that kind of thing, you should use that kind of workflow. Uh, Basically what happened when IDEs emerged and became a thing. That is the best practices side. That's a great example. Yeah, what I see in terms of things being offered 
for me, it's more of in terms of prepackaged higher level abstractions. So I don't think developers should everyone know how to deal with Kubernetes at a deeper level, the same way as I don't know how to build the Linux kernel, even though I use Linux every day. I think things should be wrapped up in a way that developers can focus on what matters to them, which is right now basically writing code. So developers should be able to you know, get to the office in the morning, open up their computer, start writing code or doing whatever else they want to do, and not worry about Kubernetes, not worry about Lambda, not worry about how is this getting built and how is this getting deployed and how is this getting tested, what's the underlying mechanism. I'd love for higher level patterns of those to emerge and be very easy to to use for everyone. Yes, it's going to be very interesting. I think best practices is such an interesting thing to to think about because somebody could sit down and write, oh, these are the best practices we should be following in this space. But I think it's, it's my opinion, it's really going to come out of what worked historically when we have enough data to look at uh, over the years. And I think it's going to be like, as far as tooling goes, sort of like a survive, survival of the fittest. Whatever tool was has been had, has been used the most, that's what's going to be the best practice way to do things. And yeah, we know today there are so many tools, but I think probably we're going to get to a point where we, we know what to use for what in the future. And with that, we have to wrap up because we are at the top of the hour. It was so great to have Ellen or L, how she, I think, prefers to be called. <laughs> and <laughs> to have you on the show, Ella, thank you so much. I mean, Elle, see, I can't even <laughs> follow my own. <laughs> and you're very active on Twitter. We're going to have all the information for how to reach you on the show notes. We're going to have a transcript. And as always, people subscribe, follow us on Twitter so you can be up to date with what we are doing. And uh, suggest episodes too on our GitHub repo. And with that, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, El. Thank you, Thank you, Michael. And thank you. Thank you, Duffy. Thank you. you. Until next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. It really was. Thank you for listening to the Podlets Cloud Native Podcast. Find us on Twitter at the Podlets and on the podlets.io website. That is the Podlets all together, where you'll find transcripts and show notes. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned by subscribing. 